the very principles that Turing set out that shows that computing devices are possible are the very principles that hackers exploit. And that's why you can't get rid of hacking, because if you got rid of hacking, you get rid of computers. Hello, my geeselings. It is Robinson Earhart, Mother Goose, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 51. And this episode was really fun. I talked with Scott Shapiro, who's the Charles F. Southmain Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at Yale Law School, where he is also the founding director of the Yale Cybersecurity Lab. So talking with Scott was in part so fun because we got to talk about one of my favorite people, Heim Gaifman, who, if you're a listener of the show, you'll know because he's been a guest four times. But Scott actually got his PhD at Columbia after he got his, uh, his JD from Yale. And he studied with Heim and he studied with a couple of other legendary professors, Isaac Levi and Sidney Morgan Besser. So we started off, we talked about that, and then we got into philosophy of law, which is Scott's main area of expertise. And we talked about two things to start off with. We talked about uh, the difference between analytic and normative jurisprudence. And then we talked about some progress in the philosophy of law, mainly focusing on John Austin and Henry Hart. And a lot of the material we covered in that section of the interview comes from Scott's book, Legality. And then he also has this really terrific 15 or 16 episode podcast called Jurisprudence Course. But there is a second season coming out uh, soon. He's just uh, starting to record now that's on a really, really interesting, really cool topic. But I can't say anything more about that. You'll just have to wait. And... After that, we then turn to Scott's upcoming book, Fancy Bear Goes Fishing, The Dark History of the Information Age in Five Extraordinary Hacks, which comes out on May 23rd, and you should pre-order that on Amazon. But this book is really cool. He talks about the intersection between cybersecurity, hackers, uh, philosophy of law, the justice system. And first, we get into how the book got its name, which is an interesting story in itself. And so is the cover art, which is really cool. And Scott was telling me, I guess you'll hear about it, that it was generated by AI. Uh, But we talk about the psychology of hackers. We talk about the hack of Paris Hilton's cell phone, and then some of the philosophical issues that surround all of this. So you guys can keep up with Scott on Twitter at at Scott J. Shapiro, and he's just about the funniest person on Twitter that I follow. Uh, But without any further ado, I hope you guys really enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed talking to Scott. So the first thing that I'm curious about, though, is how you ended up a, a jurisprude. And parenthetically, uh, calling somebody a jurisprude for somebody who doesn't use that word sounds almost insulting. Uh, yeah, but of course, yeah, yeah. I was looking at your CV and the path you took through law and philosophy was rather surprising to me just because you got your JD at Yale and then six years later, you got your PhD in Colum- at Columbia. And usually, at least as far as I can tell, it seems to go the other way around or yeah. they go hand in hand. So I was wondering if like you thought you were going to be a lawyer and then you're just like, well, actually, I'm really interested in the jurisprudence. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's obviously a very sensible question. Um, uh, So I would say that I always want to be a philosopher, not not always, but like in college, I want to be a philosopher. but I was too scared. I thought I can't make it as a philosopher. Subjects too hard, hard to get jobs. Um, I guess I'll be a lawyer. Uh, so <laughs> I went to law school, and I, I I just found that I just was reading philosophy 
a lot and um and I really wanted to be a philosopher and this was this is one of the things that I tell my students when they ask about whether they should get a PhD in philosophy I, I I say to them and maybe this doesn't apply to you but um but I always say only get a PhD in philosophy if you can't imagine your life without it mm -hmm. um because it's a very hard experience it's a very demanding experience you know there are really humiliating aspects of it there are very dispiriting aspects of it and there's some great and then obviously incredibly great aspects to it but it's not a, it's not something you do it's like something you have to do and i that at least for me that's how i felt i felt like i would not be happy like with myself if i didn't do it um and so right after law school i went to grad school of philosophy and the program was six years and I finished. And then um, I was doing probability theory, um, but I figured I couldn't get a job in probability theory. So I tried to figure out something where I could get a job doing something philosophical um, in a law school. And so my thesis wasn't even in jurisprudence and legality wasn't even part of what I was doing my research, it's just that I was working on rules and the nature of sequential decision making and then applied it to law in the last chapter of the thesis. And then, um, but I, that I hadn't actually gotten into jurisprudence at that point. I was doing things that I could plausibly get a job in the law school doing. Um, uh, given the fact that I had a PhD in philosophy and a degree from the law school and I was a member of the bar and I practiced a little bit. Um, and so the idea of legality happened later from that. Now, I'll just say one more thing, which is that, you know, my view is that people repudiate the first thing they do after undergraduate. So if they start law, they repudiate that, they do philosophy, they see philosophy, they repudiate that kind of law. Um, so, um, you know, the question is, what did you, which thing did you pick first? <laughs> and so you got rid of it. Um, so, and then one question that students often ask me, what's the optimal thing to do? Like go to law school first, go to philosophy school, do it together. So it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. and, and so we were both at Columbia and we were joking that we've had a couple of the same teachers, Haim and Akila, and... One person that you did study with, though, that I did not was Isaac Levi or Levy. Is it Levi? Levi. Levi. Levi, Levi yeah. Levi. And he's sort of a legendary figure in the department. But all I really know about him is Carol Rovane told me that he once said of Heim that Heim Gaifman thinks it's immoral to pay any attention to time. And Heim is a huge character and he would call he calls me sometimes at like 2 or 3 a.m he just like does not pay attention to clocks at all <laughs> but i was wondering right. what what was studying with isaac like well, okay so i can also tell you what studying with chaim geitman was like which yeah uh, I, would, I was, was gonna get to a, that a what just a wild experience and also isaac levi like that was also a crazy experience um i will just say let me address this by saying like what got me into philosophy was both Isaac's and my mentors, which was Sidney Morgan Besser. Yeah, he's you know, the other um, legendary figure in the department. Yeah, so Morgan Besser was a legend, uh, rightly right rightly so. He was unbelievably funny, unbelievably smart. He's a brilliant guy and he was a character who was really funny. And um, he was really influential for Isaac when Isaac was young. Um, Morgan Besser was very into the pragmatists. Um, so was Levi. I mean, it's really interesting. They were both. They both went to Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, Columbia up the hill was like the home of John Dewey. Um, it was like the you know. Pragmatism like was a big thing in the fifties still, um, and Morgan Besser mentored Levi 
um, and then Levi took these ideas um, and really created an amazing, amazing, like monster theory of like everything. He was so ridiculously smart, uh, Levi. He was a, he was a genius, um, uh, and he had this incredible talent for asking what philosophical point is there to this formalism? Like, what is the philosophical justification for introducing this aspect of the formalism? And so he would, he did something that like very few people did or still do, which is crit be critical about formal structures. Um, and he was incredibly good at manipulating these formal structures to um, express the kind of pragmatism that he himself um, was attracted to. Um, he was ferocious, absolutely ferocious. Um, he was, I remember I gave him chapter two of my dissertation. He said, I hope this is in garbage like the first <laughs> chapter. Um, uh, one time when we were going over a chapter, eight hours eight hours i was like professor i gotta go pee yeah that's what like he said too. i'll I, i'll come with you <laughs> and uh. i mean so like there was a way in which uh, you know he was brilliant he was scary as hell um and he was brutal um but he was incredibly kind to me, and I think he was a really good person. Um, and he, I mean, I, I feel like I owe him everything because he gave me, he gave me so much time, and I really feel like I was blessed to work with a guy like that, like a great mind. Um, and um, uh, but he was a very divisive person, very divisive, and. Um, he hated certain ways of doing philosophy, especially how they did it in Princeton. Um, and that wasn't great. Um, it wasn't great for somebody to like say that a good, you know, 80% of what people are doing in philosophy is crap. You should ignore it. I can see why he and Heim that, got along. Yeah. But can I tell you my favorite Heim story? Oh, yes, please. Okay, so, um, so I, I took I took Chaim. Uh, so it's for for the audience. I mean, maybe they know this already. Yeah, he's been a guest four that. times on the show. Oh, so. oh, okay, okay. So, so he's like he's just crazy smart, that guy. Um, and um, and um, like he would, so, I took him for mathematical logic one and two, and mathematical logic one began with thirty five people and ended with three people. <laughs> Me, uh, Horacio La Costa, the late Horacio La Costa, who, who was like the editor of the journal Philosophical Logic for a couple of years, and then the PhD student at, from CUNY in math, and me. And I was like clearly the dumb one there. Um, and uh, he would just walk in, just walk in, pick up a piece of chalk, and just start writing on the board for an hour and a half. Like teaching, teaching, you know, going through theorems, and he, I mean, he was a great teacher. He was really clear. Um, he knew every. I mean, like you couldn't, you couldn't trip. He, you couldn't trip, trip him up. You couldn't say, wait, why is that? Like, why is that not a biconditional? And he wouldn't just stand there and go like this and think for a second. He goes, oh, maybe, yeah, no, no. He would just like say, no, <laughs> like you idiot. Um, so uh, when so. At the like at the second semester of the second um, second half of the second semester of mathematical logic, there was something called the intentional isomorphism theorem. Um, I don't know when you took him. Did you use Mendelssohn? Uh, no, the he Mendelssohn likes to teach from logic? his own notes. Oh, I see. Okay, so we used uh, Mendelssohn's book, and the, the, there's a, the the thing in the intentional isomorphism theorem is a double recursion. There's one recursion, then there's a recursion within the recursion. And I had a really hard time with the second recursion. And I went up to him, I go to his office, I say, Professor Gackman, I don't understand this. I understand the first recursion. I can't get the second recursion. He said, 
don't, he said, don't worry, don't worry. Even talented students have problems with this. I mean, I just had to laugh because, like, I knew what he meant. Yeah. In both ways. Like, I had no sense that I was a talented student in this. Like, definitely not. <laughs> but you don't say that. But right. he's just, he's just like, he's so smart and he's so intelligent and he's such a creative and important logician and philosopher. That, yeah. Like, that's the thing is, like, I don't know about you, but like, and there was this, there was an old model of like being a graduate student where you just got your ass kicked all the time. Yeah. Well, um, and well, if you made it, then like if if you, if it was a it was, I felt like it was a form of hazing. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Which, well, he, which he told, I don't practice. He told me that. I mean, he missed the good old days in Israel when he could fail 95 percent of his students i think this is just uh, a rumor that he like failed one of the israeli prime ministers but when, when i told him <laughs> that you and i were talking he remembered you and he said that you were really good and he really liked you uh, and that's i mean such a phenomenal compliment from haim but uh my yeah i cut yeah, no, right. Uh, he, I, I, that makes me really happy. Yeah, my uh, favorite Heim story, and then then we'll move on to some philosophy of law. But my favorite Heim story is just very personal. So we were uh, we spent a lot of time together, and when I was working on my uh, writing sample for PhD programs, I was really anxious about it. And we were, I was walking him home, and he said, "Robinson, you're a warrior," and I was like, really? That's like, that's so nice of you. And he was like, and I'm a warrior too. And I was like, wow, that that's so great. I can't believe you'd, you'd say that. And he said, what are you talking about? It's not a good thing. We worry, we worry, we worry, and then we can't fall asleep at night. <laughs> and I was like, oh. oh I love that. Yeah. Because <laughs> he, I mean, he's got a thick Israeli accent. No, still. of course, he's got his thick Israeli accent, but... um yeah, that's that that that's that's funny. He he once said to me after I got my job, he said, "Oh no no Scott, we consider you one of our one of our successes." <laughs> I didn't know that was a question. <laughs> like, I I I thought it was, I, I like I got my PhD, I got a job. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. But anyway, you like it's just you know, it's like a different. It's a different. It was a different way of approaching things. Um, and I feel like I will just say again, I feel extremely blessed to have unbelievably talented, brilliant teachers like I have had. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well that that was really fun for me. But uh, jurisprudence. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I so I've listened to your jurisprudence course podcast and looked a lot at legality, and they're both great. So, I mean, in the in the introduction, I'm going to reiterate to all of my listeners that they should definitely check it out. Oh, and you. I saw that you're, you're going to start doing a second season too. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing a second season. We're starting on Monday. So in, in describing what jurisprudence is, you said that it, it seems to sort of break down into two disciplines, one of which has a normative component and the other is more analytic. So what, what's the motivation between these two branches? Where do they diverge? What sort of questions do they seek to ask that differ well, from one another? So in, yeah, sure. So in, in, in a later article that I wrote with David Plunkett, the analogy that we use is like, think of the analytic side like meta-ethics and think of the, um, you know, the normative side is like normative first order theorizing um, in moral theory. So you can think of like moral theory is broken down to a normal thing and an analytical thing. You know, we call one moral philosophy and we call the other one meta ethics. Um, for uh, for our non philosophical so, audience, though, oh, okay, could, uh, could you spell that out a little bit? Yeah, I wasn't sure who was like whether I should just assume. Yeah. Right. So 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 um, you know when you when you take a course in ethics. You know, part of what you learn is different moral theories about like first order moral judgments, you know, utilitarianism, Kantianism, the morality of lying, 
um, you know, consent, all these sorts of things. And you talk about, you use, you know, thought experiments and, you know, what should you do? But then there's this other area called metaethics, which is an analyzes legal thought and talk. Uh, I'm sorry, moral, uh, ethical thought and talk. So like when you say, you know, you're obligated to keep your promises, like what do you mean obligation? What does that mean? Um, are, um, you know, uh, uh, when you say um, uh, murder is wrong, is there a fact in the world uh, to which that corresponds, that is the wrongness of murder? Um, and that's like, those are analytic questions because we're saying whatever you think in the first order matter, at the meta level, what are you talking about? Like, what are you saying? Um, and I feel like the same thing happens in jurisprudence, right? You have the, you have like, well, what should the law be? Um, you know, should women have the right to terminate their pregnancies if they want to? Yada, yada, yada. But then on the other side, it's like, what do we even mean by law? What do we mean by you're legally obligated to pay your taxes? Mm. Does that mean you're morally obligated? What's the difference between legal obligation and moral obligation? What ground? legal facts do moral facts ground legal facts so these are kind of analytic questions which are separate so I think it's a very natural philosophical thing to do to distinguish the normative from the analytic okay and the normative is the first group the analytic then is the second group. Yes, just, right so normative or moral sometimes it goes for moral philosophy would be like the normative stuff and metaethics would be the analytic stuff. And the same thing here. Like, what should the law be? That's the normative stuff. What is law? That's the analytic stuff. I see. And and then one of the, I'd say, questions that you use to sort of frame all of the responses or views in this analytical branch is this question of the chicken and egg. And yeah. I just I just love that. It's really fun. And again, you have an entire episode on this in your podcast and it'll it's there in, in much more depth. But what is this chicken and egg problem as it relates to the philosophy of law? And I, I understand that it generally is the form of how can one thing exist, e.g. Uh, the chicken when it depends on the egg and vice versa. But how does this relate to law? Yeah, absolutely. So. One of the things to notice, and, you know, when you tell people this completely freaks them out, okay? But <laughs> if, you look in, uh, if you look in the Constitution of the United States, um, there's something called Article 7. And Article 7 is like, if you get 10 out of the 13 colonies, um, I forgot what they called them, colony states maybe, yeah, um, to vote for this, then it becomes... It, uh, Constitution is in force. Okay. Okay. So, like, you, so you needed ten. I think I think Connecticut was the the tenth. I, I I forget who the tenth was that brought the Constitution into being. Though, of course, all thirteen states eventually um, ratified it. Um, and then you say, well, wait a second. Like, Article Seven controls the the kind of the legal validity or the legal reality of the constitution. But have you ever noticed that article seven is part of the constitution? Like how can the thing be operative so that it brings the document into being before it itself is has force, which means the constitution already had to be in being. So like you can think of the chicken and egg being like, the egg would be like Article 7. The chicken would be the entire Constitution. And so you're like, okay, well, the Constitution comes about because of Article 7, but why does Article 7 come about because of the Constitution? Why did the Constitution come about because of Article 7? So this kind of so you need some way to kind of, if you will, bootstrap the Constitution into existence. And that's like the question, how do you bootstrap chickens into existence? So it's the same sort of same sort of thing. To abstract from that just a little bit to make sure that I understand it, is it something like on the one hand, you have the rules or the laws, and then on the other hand, you have the creators of the rules and the laws? 
So, uh, I mean, the laws sort of depend on there being rule, um, somebody who creates them, but somebody who creates them depends on there being laws that enable them to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So you could do this in terms of rules and people. So you say, oh, why does this rule exist? Well, somebody with authority made it. Well, how did that person get authority? Well, there's a rule that confers that authority. Who made that rule? Somebody with authority. So, like, that's the that's the kind of infinite regress that goes mm -hmm. up. Um, uh, and so it becomes like, what grounds law? If if you think that rules ground law, and people with authority need to make them, how that come into being? Mm -hmm. And then before we get into some specifics, I just want to make sure I'm also on the right track that this puzzle is so fundamental that it prove it provides a way in which we can compare uh, various legal theorists to see how they approach yeah. this puzzle. Okay. No, that's right. I mean, in a way, right. In a way, it's like the question of social construction um, and social ontology. You know, that is like. What makes it the case that, you know, like a dollar is a dollar, you know? He says, like, you know, well, we all decided to make it a dollar, or to, to, you know, it was like, well, how did that make it a dollar? Um, well, we had authority. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve did it. Well, we, but somebody made the rule for the federal authority to do it. So there's this, first of all, the chicken egg puzzle is like, how do you ground something that depends on the existence of something that requires its own ground. Um, this is a, like a very standard thing in philosophy. We see this a lot. Um, I just thought it was like a really good way to kind of get into thinking of different theories as answers to this puzzle. So John Austin, who thought that all law rested on power, thought that like, what you know, what does the law bottom out in? Chickens the biggest chicken, the super chicken, the chicken that can co coerce all the other chickens. Um, and so that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, well, you know who creates these rules? People. Well, how do people create the rules without them there being rules already giving them the authority? Well, that's what's really interesting about people, which is that they have the ability to give themselves rules. And that's why I think that... Um, really philosophy of law is kind of applied philosophy of action just like we can give ourselves intentions just like we can give ourselves rules and policies of certain sorts groups can do that and when done in a certain form that's when you get law this 19th century legal theorist john austin is where you start a lot of your discussion so he's clearly a, a very important figure and what i found particularly fascinating about your discussion of John Austin, your introduction of him, is that you say that his view is on the one hand, I mean, I'm sure there are, there have been lots of changes in the past uh, 100 plus years, uh, but it's the received view. And yet you also uh, describe it as spectacularly false. <laughs> so what about his view is so intuitively appealing that so many people adhere to it? But that is wrong. Yeah, so I would just say the following. So it was the received view for 100 years before HLA Hart came okay. and showed it couldn't possibly be right. I see. Um, it's a beautiful example to me of, like, there are philosophical discoveries and there is progress because, like, for 100 years, people believe the stupidest theory um, because it is intuitively plausible except if you give it more than 10 seconds thought, you realize it can't possibly be, be, be true. Um, and so um, uh, what, I, what I love about it is it's a theory that's so obviously false. It's not obviously false. It's, it's so false. Like almost everything about it is wrong. Um, but people believed it for so long because it was the only thing that was there. Um, and then a guy comes along, H.L.A. Hart, and absolutely destroys it, like in a book, mm -hmm. such that nobody. It's like it's like what Kripke did with like 
mill on you know names. Or yeah, something. you also like, you also compared it, I think, to Noam Chomsky's takedown of Skinner as one of the, the greatest philosophical takedowns of all time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like the guy, like Chomsky, writes a review of Skinner's book, and everyone's like, "Okay, that's never going to work." Um, and that was the end of that program. Um, and I think the same thing was with Hart. The same thing, you know, like. You could say that about Gettier. Um, you know, there's certain just like, even though that was like of a particular thesis rather than, uh, so Edmund, uh, Edmund, Edmund Gettier, not Edward, Edmund. Right? I think that's, so, I think um, that's right. Yeah. That, that, yeah, anyway, sorry. that knowledge yeah, cannot so be justified to, true belief. Right. Exactly. So he, he came up with a very kind of, really smart uh, counterexample. And it was like, yeah, that's a counterexample. Uh, so like there are these really amazing moments in the history of philosophy where philosophers get things right. Um, and you're like, wow, that really advanced our knowledge. Um, and um, uh, what, what I think is more interesting is not why Austin was wrong, but why Hart was wrong. Um, but I, I, I could talk about Austin, but, but, but I think in some sense, like almost like, Nobody seriously believes that that can possibly be the uh, way to understand law, that it, it mm -hmm. really depends on power. I can tell you where my view differs from him, which is to say, is that I think that all law depends on ta power wrapped in a thin veneer of bullshit. Um, meaning that, like, it, of course, it's power, but it's always made under the claim of right. Mm. It, it's always said, like, we're, we're allowed to do this, morally speaking. So if if I'm right though, before we move on from Austin, because I would like to hear about Hart's spectacular takedown, uh, yes. it seems like Austin's view was roughly that law equates to rules and sovereignty, and laws are commands. They're they're just threats. But so how does Hart totally dismantle that? Yeah, so so very, very one of the very appealing things about Austin's theory is you can explain it in one sentence. <clears throat> so for him, the law is a set of general commands backed by threats of sanction issued by somebody who is habitually obeyed and habitually obeys no one else. So rules are general commands, which are these general threats, and they're issued by somebody who has the special property is that everyone habitually, obey, well, most people habitually obey him or them, and they habitually obey no one else. Now, as I mean, there's so many things that are wrong with it. Here's here's one thing that's wrong with it. If you were to say um, uh, the, most rules um, that we think of may have the form of threats, you know, like don't kill somebody, pay your taxes. Um, don't defraud other people, um, you know, uh, shovel your sidewalk when it snows so that if somebody, so somebody walks by, then they'll slip and fall. And if you do any of those things, we're going to put you in jail. We're going to fine you. We are going to charge you tax penalties, or we're going to make you pay for this guy's surgery that he sl uh, for his slip and fall. Okay. That feels like an Austin, like threats backed by sanctions, but there are all these other rules that seem nothing like that. And most of the laws, you, uh, the rules you learn in law school are like that, like constitutional law. Like when it says Congress, uh, Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce, mm -hmm. why is that a threat? Right, right, right. It's just not a threat. Um, and so Hart said that there was a distinction um, between, two, a fundamental distinction in the law between two kinds of rules. What he, one he called the duty imposing rule that imposes duties on people, pay the taxes, don't kill people. And then power conferring rules. There are rules that confer power on people to do various things. And like wills, buy property, um, you know, transfer um, uh, stocks in one person's name into in somebody else's name. There are all these things that we do that the law enables us to do, get married, um, that we wouldn't be able to do without the law. Like take a will. How do you make sure that after you're dead? Like your property goes to your loved ones in accordance with your last will and testament. Well, the law gives you this thing, and so it would be—it's really misleading to think of the law as giving threats backed by sanctions. We should think of the law as giving us 
as Hartset amenities, we would call it now affordances, a technology for doing things that we wouldn't be able to do without the law. And once you see that, that of course the law has all these powers to make our lives better, or some people's lives better and other people's lives worse, um, you realize that any theory that says, no, they're, they're threats backed by sanctions, just is completely, th- doesn't understand what law is. That's one thing. Another thing is like, there's this nice, this is such a nice counter example. So um, the law is a rule issued by the sovereign. So a sovereign is somebody who's habitually obeyed and habitually obeys no one else. Yeah. And so Hart said, okay, imagine some Rex one. He is the, he's the sovereign. Everyone that habitually obeys him. And now he appoints his son, Rex Jr., is going to be Rex two. When he dies, Rex two is the sovereign. Rex one dies. All of a sudden, Rex two is the sovereign, but there's no habitual obedience to Rex two because he's not it, it, like nobody's had, had the chance to habitually obey him. Yeah. So he can't be the sovereign, but of course he's the sovereign. He was just appointed the sovereign by Rex one. And so how do you, how do you explain continuity of legal authority with a model that's purely based on power? When somebody dies, they die. They're gone. Their power's gone. Their brute power is gone. But if there are rules that are operating in the background, well, they can continue. They can have a cross-temporal continuity that enables people to do things they wouldn't be able to do otherwise, even in the absence of a habit, just because the rule exists. So there are just like thousands and thousands of mistakes that, that Austin makes. And it's really helpful when you teach to say, when you show that a theory is wrong, this becomes the conditions of adequacy for understanding what, how you should build your theory, okay? Because your theory should ideally solve the problems of the previous theory. So you're not just trying to criticize another theory. You're trying to state conditions of adequacy for your own theory. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is really powerful about um, uh, Hart's takedown. Mm. Okay. And then last thing on the general jurisprudence before we get into the topic du jour of cybersecurity. And I found I found all of this very interesting, but Hart's positive contribution after the takedown. And in particular, I, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about the rule the three rules, the the rules of of recognition, change, and adjudication, and how they they sort of solve some of the problems that we were left with from Austin's account. Right. So what would explain the fact that Rex 2 is Rex 2 right after Rex 1 dies? Well, the plausible thing to say is, well, there are rules in the system that create an office and rules for who gets to inhabit that office. And in the case of um, uh, Rex one, he inhabited the office, but the rules say that whoever Rex one appoints as the successor is the successor. Um, and so as soon as Rex one dies, Rex two now has the power of, the, of sovereignty because there's this rule that's a, that, that, that says whoever Rex one says to uh, be the sovereign becomes a sovereign. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of what Hart called kind of the rule of change. That is, who gets to change the law? There are two other rules, the rule of recognition, which is the rule of recognition, the rule of change, and rule of adjudication are what Hart calls secondary rules. That is, they are rules about rules. So the rule of change says Rex 2 gets to change the rules. Right. Now, what are the rules? Well, that's the rule of recognition. The rule of recognition says that any rule that has certain properties is authoritative. Okay? And then the rule of adjudication says if there's a rule and somebody claims that it's been violated or conformed, you need somebody to engage in fact-finding. These are the people that have the power to adjudicate, and then those are the rules that pick up the court system and the judges mm-hmm. of that legal system. And the According to Hart, these three rules are the foundation of a legal system and that they come into existence by virtue of the fact that they're practiced by legal officials. The fact that judges take the rule of recognition to be the standard that they're going to assess other rules by in cases that come before them 
is what makes it the case that the rules that have those characteristics are the ones that courts should impose because courts have the ability to make rules for themselves because they're people and humans can make rules for themselves because we're planning agents and we are social. We, we, we not only can plan things over time for ourselves, but we can also plan to do things with each other. And so the story that I think Hart comes out with is this idea that actually groups can create rules for themselves um, by virtue of some deep metaphysical facts about either agency or what rules are. Um, this is a part of Hart's theory that in some sense he never fully worked out because, you know, the philosophy of action was not very well developed at that time. You didn't have any theories of shared agency, theories of, you know, kind of social ontology, social action. So a lot of the things that Hart said in some sense are philosophically anemic because he just didn't have the, the tools at his disposal to make it. I think nowadays, and I, I'm personally attracted to like, like Ratman's theory of intentions mm -hmm. as plans, and I think that rules are uh, that laws are plans, um, and I think that had Hart like lived later and seen developments of philosophy of action, he might have filled out his picture with the kind of idea that like legal officials are engaged in a shared activity. Well, so. Uh there have been a lot of developments since Hart. I mean, uh, you talk a lot about the hart vorkin debate, uh, and we're not going to get into all of that. But just to end this little section with a with a tidy little knot, how does how does Hart's solution relate then to this problem of the chicken and the egg? Yeah. So, like, so, so let me just say this is Hart's theory. So Hart thought that a social rule was was identical to the practice. Mm -hmm. So a social rule exists if and only if in the group there are people that treat it as a standard of behavior and act accordingly. That's because rules just are the practices that, that instantiate them. And so if you think that rules just are practices, then it's easy to break the infinite regress because you say who created the rule who created the rule which uh, which gave rex to the power of sovereignty the answer is well what we want to know is did people engage in this practice oh look they are engaged in this practice therefore there is a rule the rule confers power on rex 2 therefore rex 2 has a power end of end of the, 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 the infinite regress. The problem is, is that it's not true that rules are reducible to practices. <laughs> it's just false. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that doesn't work, but it's, it's very much in the direction of where you should look, I think, in trying to solve the chicken egg puzzle. Um, and I think, my, I think kind of contemporary philosophy of action helps us answer those sorts of questions by using the idea that um, that we are planning agents mm -hmm. and that we're able to act together and that law is a, what I call a massively shared activity. Yeah, and speaking of contemporary philosophy of action, you already mentioned Michael Bratman, who's here at Columbia. And I'm definitely hoping to have him on the show since he's, I mean, the, the central figure in all of philosophy. Wait, you mean, you, mean Stan, you, you mean Stanford? What did I say? You said Columbia. Oh, yeah, I meant I meant Stanford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for for catching oh, yeah. me. Um, no, 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 sure. Stan, no, Michael is. I mean, Michael's the best ever. <laughs> like I love that guy. He's so freaking smart, and he's so great, and he's so nice. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant. Very loved and, here. Oh yeah, for for obvious reasons. Yeah. Okay. He's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Cybersecurity now, uh, right. which I'm I'm very curious about now. First, your upcoming book, how did it get its title? So the subtitle, The Dark History of the Information Age in Five Extraordinary Hacks, 
that tells me uh, that tells me a bit. <laughs> but where does Fancy Bear Goes Fishing come in? Yeah. So so um, so um, what what happened was the original title was Insecurity. You know, because the idea was we're all insecure. Not just our computers are insecure, but actually we're all insecure about the fact that we don't know if our computers are secure or not. Like we all feel like really bad. <laughs> like we don't know how the shit works. Right. Um, um, and so I want to write a book that would explain how it works. Um, um, like uh, how to how people can overcome their insecurities in both senses. Like understand what's going on and make themselves a bit safer. Um, and um, then. As happens in these situations, uh, my editors were like, this isn't the right title. Let's come up with a different one. So my wife is a literary agent, not my agent, but an agent. She, she, um, she says, yeah, insecure is not right. She goes, let me see your table of contents. She, I, 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 Chapter 9 says, Fancy Bear Goes Fishing. That's your title. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I was like, oh you're, oh, you're right. That is the – and then – I, the idea for the cover was we typed in it into an AI program. Oh, really? Typed in Fancy Bear. Yeah, so we typed it into Midjourney, and it spit out that. You know, so I was like, put it into. I, I you know, I got some really cool stuff from from. Um, it wasn't Midjourney; it was uh, Dolly. Um, and so they put they put it into Midjourney, and it came out with this incredible image. Um, and um, that's that that's how how it happened. So just so you so. As my wife also explained to me that like what you want in publishing is you want um, people to be surprised, intrigued, confused by the title. So like you really don't want to do what academics do, you know. So Michael Bratman's first book is called Intention plans, practical reason. Like, there's no mystery there. No. It's about intentions, plans, practical reason. Um, well, of course, because like, that's like, that's how academics do it. But like here, you're supposed to do it differently. So um, Fancy Bear is the name of, uh, that was given to it by CrowdStrike um, for the mil- one of the military hacking units of the GRU in Russia, which hacked the DNC, and they did it through a phishing attack. So Fancy Bear Goes Fishing had a nice kind of alliteration and a nice kind of cadence. And then it helps the fact, so it was just a chapter title because it was a chapter title about the Fancy Bear hat. And then my wife's like, that's a great title. Just put it as the title of the book. I was like, okay. And so that's how that that happened. Okay. You seem like the right person to be writing this book since you're the director and founder of Yale's Cybersecurity Lab, which sounds like an awesome, crazy, high-tech place, even though I have no idea what it actually is. And so I also saw that you wrote you hacked your first computer at the age of 52. And all of this seems like a somewhat strange pastime pastime for uh, a jurisprude. So how how did this end up all happening? Yeah, no one more surprised than me. Um, so I would say, so, um, let me just tell you the trajectory. So, so first of all, I, in a past life, when I was at Columbia, I was a computer science and philosophy major. Um, and I like, you know, I grew up at a time when the first microcomputers, personal computers were coming online and my parents got me an Apple II, um, you know, and then I used a TRS-80 at, at school. Mm-hmm. And I was just really into it. And I loved it. And I studied in college. Um, I did some work in graduate school. Um, and I just shut it down because I was like moving on to law school and graduate school. And I, you know, and then when the internet came along and I mean, the windows, when windows came along, it was like boring because like when you were working on the command line, when everything was like typing things, you knew what you were doing, but with a GUI, with a graphical user interface, you, you use a mouse and everything's hidden. And it wasn't fun anymore. Like, to you, you couldn't play with it. It felt opaque. Um, and so I became like everyone else. Like, I don't know how this works. I don't know what HTTP is. I have no idea what uh, Apache is, even though I see Apache all the time. What is Apache? Um, and um, so I stopped it. And then 
So I wrote this book. Uh, after legality, I wrote a book on the philosophy of war. Uh, it, it was like the history of uh, the rev- evolution of war over four centuries. And it was a lot of an examination, not just of the like historical stuff, but the philosophical underpinnings of how various rules and laws of war came into being. And so the question, that, and I wrote this with my great um, uh, friend and colleague, Ona Hathaway, um, at Yale, when we wrote about international law and the evolution of laws of war, it's called The Internationalists, and uh, the very long books, I found the pages, but I, I, think it's, I, I think it's a good read. But um, what we did um, is we wrote, it was from Grotius, you know, Hugo Grotius, Yeah, I talked about ISIS. him with Steve Darwell uh, a lot. Oh, right, right, yeah. So Grotius is a fascinating, evil, evil person. Um, and so uh, it's amazing that, like, people, like, find him so awesome because he was, like, <laughs> pretty not awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was from Grotius to ISIS, you know, 2014. So people were saying, well, what about cyber war? What about the next stage? So I was like, okay. So I started... I was like, okay, let me learn about this because, like, I know, I, you know, I, I know how to code. Uh, I know how to, you know, what a pointer is. And I, I know this stuff, and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, and then we taught a class together, me, Ona, and some of the computer, computer science department it was terrible. I didn't understand anything. I was amazed that anybody ever writes in cybersecurity because I found it almost impossible to understand. Almost impossible to understand, but in part because, like, I thought I had all the tools to be able to understand it and yet i couldn't understand it and um so i was like i need to learn i need to learn this because i can't like i can't think about cyber war without like knowing how hacking works and all this stuff and so i just started learning it and i started learning how to learn it it's a it's a very Im- um, immature field in the sense that it's very young there are like textbooks that you can buy that will really teach you how the things work. Um, basically, you have to watch YouTube. <laughs> That's how you learn it. You watch hundreds of hours of YouTube, um, watching different exploits, different you know hacking techniques. You know, I I I study, I, I taught a hacking class with uh, two two you know uh, um, colleagues, but I mean they were colleagues of, like they were. You know, IT people. One was a, sys- it runs a privacy lab at Yale. Another one was a, it did his PhD, a DPhil in Oxford in the sociology of cybersecurity, but he was a network administrator. You have to learn these things from people who know it hands on. And so I learned it that way. And then I was like, I should write. I mean, I would, I, 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 I like, it would be good to write this up and explain to people how it happened. Like, 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 how the, how this works? Like, how, what is cybersecurity? How does it work? And so I I I decided to do it through five hacks, um, which I write about in the book. Fancy Bear being one of them. Mm-hmm. And bef- before we get into uh, some some of these specific hacks that you write about, I'm curious if the lens through which you're approaching this in the book falls more in the analytical jurisprudence camp or the more normative are you talking or is it or is it just sort of unrelated to the philosophy of law or how you see it it's such a good question because in some sense it all comes full circle so let me let me just so i lay this out a bit in the introduction but it's worked out in the book so i distinguish between three layers of code i call one down code which is all the code below your fingertips. So network protocols, operating systems, microchip, uh, microcode in the microchips, you know, your routers, firmware, all that stuff below your fingertips. Upcode is all the stuff above your fingertips, your psychology, social norms, laws, you know, um, professional ethics, industry standards, terms of service, all that stuff. And so, and then I, th- one other thing I call is meta code. That's where Turing comes in, right? Yeah, that's where Turing comes in, right? So code of code, so to speak. What must be true metaphysically for computers to to exist? Very philosophical. Yeah, it's very philosophical. So the two philosophical arguments is that everyone concentrates on the down code. They think of cybersecurity as a um, 
as a um, uh, engineering problem that requires an engineering solution, when it's really an upcode problem, it's really a normative problem that requires a normative solution because downcode is causally downstream from upcode. That is, the code that for your computer was written because people were following other kinds of code, code that we have control over. Um, uh, and so what we should do is think about new technology, not from the technological perspective, although the book is very, it tries to explain the technology of it, and I take the technology of it very seriously, but it would be a terrible mistake to think that this is a technical question. It's a normative question. And so we should be focusing on social norms and legal uh, legal rules, um, uh, issues having to do with human psychology, uh, user experience, things like that, rather than like keep on throwing more and more money into developing, you know, low, bigger and bigger and more bloated um, uh, software. Um, and so on the one hand, it's like uh, the law can be thought of as code in much the same way that computer code is code. Um, so that's the and that we should really think about upcode over downcode. So that's the kind of the philosophical, the, the legal, the jurisprudential part. And the, the, you know, the more philosophical part or the more, you know, kind of philosophy of mind type things is that what the very principles that Turing set out that shows that computing devices are possible are the very principles that hackers exploit. Hmm. So to give you an example, so one of the things that Turing said was, you know, actually, you think that there's a dis difference between code and data. You know, code is active, data is passive. Um, we all know that there's this distinction, but like actually they can be both represented by numbers, right? You can just encode code as a number or encode data as a number. And if you were presented with a number, you would not know, is that code or data? And that's really important because this enables us to have general computers. That is computers that where the software is not, so to speak, built into the hardware, but where the software can be loaded into the hardware. So the software is loaded into the hardware as data and then is run as code. So the reason why we can download things from the internet and then run them is because numbers can represent either code or data. And that's great because general computers are possible, but that also is exactly the way hacking works, which is that computers expecting code, you give it data, it's expecting data and you give it code. The only way you can stop that from happening is by stopping general computing from happening. So it's it's an cybersecurity um, perfect cybersecurity is impossible for lots of reasons, one of them being like the halting problem, the undecidability of first order logic and all that stuff. But then there's this, this idea that the things, the principles that allow computers to exist um, and structure our world are the very things that are subverted by hackers um, and that there's a unity to what hackers are doing. Um, by subverting this kinds of things that make computers possible. And that's why you can't get rid of hacking because if you got rid of hacking, you get rid of computers. So th that's the philosophical argument about uh, uh, um, in the book. So like, I think there's a jurisprudential upcode over downcode and philosophical hackers exploit metacode, not just downcode. Well, obviously this is the way that the book works. I mean, you're, you're, taking these more abstract arguments and then making them more concrete for your readers with these five hacks that you go through. So maybe we could talk about one of them and how some of these more philosophical components uh, are relevant. And one of the the topics that is particularly, or one of the, the examples that's particularly salacious is uh, Paris Hilton and the hacking of the nude photos from her cell phone. But so that's that's one I'd like to hear about. But if you uh, have one in mind that you think is is better, so maybe I could tell you just the story of the Paris Hilton thing. So in two thousand five, um, 
Paris Hilton, who had like really kind of come like like she was the it girl. She had her cell phone hacked, um, and when it was hacked, it turned out that she had very embarrassing emails and notes on her on her on her sidekick too, which was the phone that was hacked. I remember those. But more important, yeah. But more importantly. Um, well, I don't know, more importantly, probably less importantly, but she had nude photos on it. And that's, of course, what everyone paid attention to. And the person who did it was part of a group, um, and his name was Cameron McCroy, who was 16 years old at the time, and nobody knew how he did it. And there are all these theories about how he did it. The New York Times wrote about how... Um, the blue uh, that uh, the sidekick's Bluetooth was um, hacked, like New York Times was on the cover. Like, um, uh, par- uh, you know, one theory is that uh, Paris Hilton's phone was hacked um, uh, through Bluetooth um, because hackers could have taken these antennas with them to the Oscar ceremonies or some big ceremony where she was walking down the run uh, the the red carpet. They hacked into the Bluetooth, and that's how they got the photos. Now, this is a good theory, except for one thing, which is the sidekick who didn't have Bluetooth. Um, so, like, <laughs> that couldn't possibly be true. They yeah. didn't even have Bluetooth. So, um, another thing was that they guessed the name of her Chihuahua, Tinkerbell. Another one was that they used this session token. Explain. I go through all these things, but what I did was I finally found Cameron McCroy. I finally found him um, uh, I, through Google, and then he got arrested again, and he got put into jail, and then I tried to reach him in jail, and then COVID happened, and he went, and because he had once called in a bomb threat, he wasn't a, he was considered violent, though he's not violent at all, and he got he was kept in jail. So like part of me was thinking he's going to die in jail, <laughs> like I, and I couldn't reach him. I tried to reach mm-hmm. him, and then he went to, uh, and so I tracked him down after four years, and then I got him to talk to me. He's a very nice person, um, and he told me the story of um, of how he really did it, and also well, that was it, the part of the book. And and one of the things I want to say is that like it has a jokey. Title: Fancy Break of Fishing, but I, 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 what, what, I, what? One of the things I was really interested in is like, why are these people doing it? Like, why are they getting into? Why are they hacking other people's computers? I understand it's fun, but like, like the, this guy keeps on going to jail. Yeah. Like, how much fun could it be? Yeah. Really. <laughs> like, like, um, and so, what, lots of the book is focused on why do people do this and so i kind of need to tell the story like their backgrounds why did they do it well yeah. cameron's mother you know died of a fentanyl overdose when he was two and he grew up you know it's like he, he had a lot he had a lot of problems with depression i mean there's a lot of he had he had a lot a lot a lot of obstacles to overcome um and um it's it, the the thing that i try to do in the book is i try to like there was this hack. How did it happen? And one of the things that people don't realize and that they didn't realize at the time is the Sidekick 2 was like the iPhone before the iPhone. The Sidekick 2 was one of the very few, it was the first commercial phone, smartphone, that used the cloud. So people thought you had to be near her in order to hack her phone. Because they thought her data was on her phone, but it it got synced to the cloud, so nobody expected you could get photos through the web that had been on somebody's cell phone. Because that, like, that wasn't like that was magic. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the time, huh. so one of the things I tried to do was like not only explain the story and why these people did it, but also it's a way of telling the story of the evolution of our digital ecosystem. Like first we had these mainframes, then we had these mini computers, then we had these micro computers, then we had um, the cloud, then we had mobile devices, then we had um, uh, IoT devices, Internet of Thing devices. And all in, in a way it's like each of these things gets hacked. It's a way of telling the story of the information age. No, but it's a dark history, so it's telling it from the perspective of 
all the things that went wrong. Yeah. No, that that's that's a really cool way of telling the story. And the, the last thing I'll ask for today, because talking about this, the hacker of Paris Hilton cell phone now has me curious. Did you find any common psychological threads among these hackers? Like, was it uh, a, like something like exhilaration? Like, is that why there, that's some aspect of it for all of them? Or what what was the overall consensus conclusion? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think that really goes to one of the hardest questions and one of the biggest questions that I focus on in the book, which is not just how, how do they do it, but why do they do it? Like, what is motivating them? And one of the mistakes I think that people make is that they think that hackers are loners. They think that they're like these weird, mentally ill people who, like, drink energy... Uh, energy drinks all day, stay up all night in their pajamas, hacking from their bed, when in fact, that's not at all what hackers are like. Hackers generally tend to be very social, but online social. That is, they tend to really, really care about peer approval. It's just the peer approval that they care about is the group online, not their friends at school, not at something else, not maybe not their parents, you know. So, one of the things that you see, or at least I saw in these stories repeatedly, was the desire to impress their friends. Um, that's what they were trying to do. They were like trying to, like, I hacked Paris and Paris Hilton self, uh, uh, cell phone. How cool is that? Yeah. You know, not so cool that he had to then go to jail. Um, it was actually a terrible decision and a terrible thing to do. He's 16 years old from a difficult home, you know, various social problems, you know, like, you know, this is what he, this is what he was good at. This is what he found fun. This is what he got fulfillment in. He was just really like immature and shouldn't have done it. Um, And one of the things you see in, in the basic criminology literature, but also um, was true in the case of Cameron, which is that people tend to age out of crime. You know, crime is for young people. As people get older, they tend not to uh, commit as much crime. And um, now that Cameron's in his 30s, I think he's aged out of it. And um, and uh, there's a lot of success stories in the book um it is not um but i didn't i wanted to do this responsibly i didn't want to write a book i mean so many cybersecurity books are like and then everything got hacked and everything blew up and you know or like you know a guy lost a, a billion dollars looking at his screen you know like this kind of oh, complete like breathless over exuberance and just you know like pumping, puffing everything up to sound so um, dangerous and scary. Um, so that was one thing I was fighting against, the run for the hills, the, you know, Armageddon's going to happen. So I want to argue against that because I don't think that's true. Mm-hmm. But then there's the other eat your vegetables. <laughs> like if you've ever read anything about cyber stickers, all about like how you're doing it wrong, like, oh, your password's only 12 characters long. It should be 14, you know, just like all these things to make you feel bad, all these things to like wagging their finger at you. So like you have like, on the one hand, run for the hills, the other one, eat your vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to write this middle book, which is like, actually, there's some exciting, (laughs) scary parts to it, but there's also human, like real, like, things we can all relate to because these are people that are doing this. And this is all about upcode, not just about downcode. You, when you see why bad code is produced, when you see why hackers hack, you see it as like a norms problem Mm -hmm. rather than no, your password's not long enough problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what I was trying to get it. And that one of the things I didn't want to do is present these people in a kind of um, cartoon fashion. 
like is typically done like on Mr. Robot. So Mr. Robot is a TV show about a hacker. And of course, the hacker is a brilliant hacker, but he also is seriously mentally ill. Um, I don't know why they need to do things like that. Like why they have to like turn everything into some like highly unusual um, something we can't kind of relate to. So this hacker, he's brilliant, but he has multiple personality disorder. Well, actually, the guy who hacked Paris Hilton, he's 16 years old, he wants to impress his friends. Like what, you know, yeah. what helps us understand why people are doing this? Um, uh, like fiction or like the real story. And the real story is really interesting. I, that's yeah. the thing is that it's, they're interesting. They're incredibly interesting stories, I think. So you can kind of, I try to explain the technology behind cybersecurity, but I, so like you learn something from the book, but I try to do it with like a kind of give you your medicine with a dose of, of, of sugar, you know, like trying to tell you these interesting stories and stuff like that. But the whole thing comes together and what I tried it, what, what I wanted it to be, which is a humane approach mm -hmm. to thinking about this phenomenon rather than a sensational um, um, exploitative uh, presentation. And so Fancy Bear Goes Fishing comes out on May 23rd on Kindle audiobook and hardcover? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I will have merch. Merch. I'm um, selling merch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the website will be called getfancybear.com. Uh, I'm setting it up. It's so great. We, um, I mean, the, yeah, the so cover is I, awesome. So I hope that plays a role in the merch. Yeah. So, yeah. So the version, it'll be the bear and I'll say get fancy. Nice. <laughs> so that's, the, that's, the, that's the, and then I was going to also do, um, I was going to do things with different things that I've tweeted. Like different. No, like your Twitter's great. Everybody races. should follow it, but way more people follow you than, than me at this point. But anyway, um, Scott, I've been looking forward to this for months. So thanks a lot for having this conversation with me. It was really fun. Well, thank you so much. This was really fun. And I, I, I really enjoy talking about the old days of Columbia, uh, John Austin, and why he's wrong, and Fancy Bear going fishing. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it.